Hostiles, 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond. Isn't the Lambda site off-world, sir? I'd like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable. First 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no sensors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. There's a very interesting phenomenon occurring off the coast of Lake Erie up in the Midwest. Gale force winds have been blowing for so long that houses are being encased in ice and it's a great opportunity to show what wind ice and snow i guess we have the lack of rock here do to structures like this all of the very sharp pronounced angles become curved become less easy to identify over a long enough period of time what you're looking at here would just look like a giant mound of ice it would be very rounded. So when we look at a place like Antarctica and we see images that have pronounced edges, we can probably make the leap that there is some type of construction underneath. Because that continual sandblasting action, that um, removing of one layer and then adding another even more curved layer on top of it, would, would not allow for this over a long period of time. This was a really great image I wanted to show because not a lot of people are aware of this. Igloos can retain a temperature of 60 degrees Fahrenheit during minus 50 degree weather outside. Fire inside melts the inner layer of ice and the cold outside refreezes it, adding a layer of insulation. So why wouldn't this be something that we could attribute to Antarctica? Even a tiny, tiny amount of heat, if it got encased in ice, like an igloo, could be something that could be used long term. And we know about the volcanic activity providing a copious amount of heat under the ice. And given the amount of fresh water and the evidence of vegetation, all of those things are not things that I've made allegation of, it's things that science has made allegation of. How could there not be some type of a civilization or the ability to settle down there? Now, I'd like to show something 
that goes right along with what we were talk talking about. Here we see, and I'll zoom out to show what this is. This is just a random region of Antarctica that has a large windswept plain near kind of a higher area right here. And as we can see, the wind blows this direction. Over here is a big empty plain. So over here, we shouldn't see anything with sharp pronounced peaks to it because of that continual blowing. But nevertheless, when we look closely, what do we see a shadow of here? How could something like this survive? Or more importantly, how could something like this not be a construction of some kind? Because going along with that Lake Erie analogy, as we saw with the house, I think that roof peak is probably going to be very visible as a roof peak for quite a long time. Why? Because it's a construction. If that were just some random hill or random rock, it would be completely sandblasted over, over 50, 75, 100 years. What they're showing from Lake Erie is a matter of just a couple of weeks and not nearly as cold as down here, and the wind isn't blowing nearly as hard as it does down here. How could something like this survive? And when you look in the shadow closely, you can see what's casting it. What is this? You're telling me this is some natural creation? How could that possibly be? It very much looks like the top of a pyramid. Now, there's not enough detail here, like we've shown with others, to make any firm statements about what this is or isn't. But I'll bet if I took the time to lighten this up, I could show real good evidence that we found another pyramid with one of those crystal tops to it. I showed this, I think, I'm not sure if it day before yesterday, and in others, this intact pyramid, and I've shown it in both inverted light and regular light, that has this crystal top. And what do we know? The pyramids in Egypt used to have these electrum tops. They weren't just made of standstone. They were covered in this silver, white, limestone-like material. And they glowed. And that's not something the Florida Maquis has alleged. That's something science has alleged. There's another location I've shown multiple times, and I'm going to show it again, because it shows up the same way in multiple years. And I've just labeled this Baphomet for very, you know, obvious reasons. It's one of the, the clear image. Now, this is 1022, 2012. This is 11 5, 2012. 1022, 2012. 11 5, 2012. Personal story I actually have a grandchild on the way. And I remember when the girls were very young. And anyone who's had little ones knows they go through phases of asking questions. And we always tried to encourage the girls to never think of any question as stupid. If anybody tries to make you feel stupid for asking a question, it's because they didn't think of it first. You see, I don't think people are asking the right questions about Antarctica. When you talk about Antarctica, there's like an authorized narrative. You can talk about it in the context of global warming only. That's it. To make the blanket statement that there is no indigenous human life to Antarctica is just wrong. Have you looked at all of Antarctica? Is, are there conditions in Antarctica that completely prohibit human life? The answer to both of those questions is no. And the reason I brought up the grandchild thing is all of a sudden, um, girls who kind of knew it all, they go through a stage like that after being young and asking all the questions, all of a sudden they know everything, are starting to ask questions again. 
and that's normal and to be expected. I've shared before that I was a United States Army interrogator. While a lot of people immediately bring images of Abu Ghraib and um, the dark room with the little square table and the light bulb, it's really the art of asking the right question the right way at the right time. Most people, 99% of people, will tell you everything you want to know without realizing it if you give them an opportunity to. I believe this of Antarctica, too. I really do. I think these images down here, Google Earth Pro, if you ask the right question at the right time, in the right way, that's when the answers are going to come. I don't know how anybody could explain this image as, well, you know, when it's really cold and the snow um, is really uh, dense and the wind blows and then... Really? You think it could create something like this? I've seen a lot of snow. Grew up in the Midwest. Grew up very close to Lake Michigan, in fact. We used to get that lake effect stuff coming across from Wisconsin and Chicago all the time. And we saw huge snow drifts. And we saw bone-chilling cold. We lived out in the country. And... One of the most beautiful parts about it was that everything was was curved and had these wonderful um, shapes to it, especially the farm fields. You could really see the rises and falls in the land. And it made some of the most majestic, beautiful landscapes out in the country. Never saw anything like this. Unless I was near a farm and someone had a goat. Then I saw images like this all the time. And you never turn your back on them. Because they're sneaky little bastards. But anyway, I digress. There's also something else I wanted to show that shows contrast. Now, many people have made the allegation that what I'm showing is just weird shadow. Here is a great example. And I've labeled this Defend Great White. Because it's what it really looks like to me. See how we have the white underneath here? We have what looks like the shape of a great white. But of course, this seems like the fins are gone. And the reason I show it is this. Do you see back here, you see this ledge? And then you see what is very clearly the shadow underneath the ledge? You see how it's an inky black? That's how you can tell this is a shadow. That's how you can tell this is not a shadow. Whatever this is, it's very, very clearly laying on the ice. Now, I've also made allegation that there's whaling and all sorts of things going on, perhaps associated with some Asian countries down here. Shark fin soup is something that is prized. They are known to catch these things, cut the fins off, and throw them back in alive, it's horrible. It's absolutely one of the most disgusting practices I've ever seen. If you're going to catch the thing, use it. And use all of it. So I just wanted to share this. We'll go ahead and do a quick measure on this. And once again, I haven't even measured this. So whatever this is, let's see. This is big, whatever it is. 46.68 meters, 150 feet long. This would definitely be in the realm of Megalodon for sure. It's very, very big. So maybe Defend Megalodon is a better name than Defend Great White. And I'm going to show a couple of other um, places where this is the case. Down here, as you can see, in the back, we have shadow. We have the ledge. We have the shadow. But then in front, what is this giant creature laying on the ice? It's very... This is not shadow because you can see it right in front of a shadow. And once again, this uh, 
area down here, because it's so mind-numbingly cold on the surface, you would never have to worry about anything rotting. You could kill it, leave it on the ice, leave it on the ice indefinitely. One more up here, the same thing. I think this is part of the explanation of what we're seeing. Is it all of it? No. I do think that there's a very ancient, very old civilization down here that lives deep under the ice. Very advanced technology. I think there may be remnants of um, the Germans down here. I also think that there's evidence of this activity, the whaling, the, the illegal fishing. Who knows what they found down here? It's one of the most unexplored, well, I think it's probably the most unexplored region of the whole planet. And many people don't realize how big Antarctica is. It's larger than all of Europe. All of Europe. It's the fifth largest continent on the planet. And there are images, even in shadow, that just defy explanation. And that's the thing about science. They've painted themselves into a corner down here, saying that it's just wind, ice, rock, and snow, and uh, leopard seals and penguins. Their own imagery, their own imagery defies this. And it does. It takes some time to look at this really... This is high altitude, 592 feet. I think because people are so slaved to their phones these days and don't want to be bothered with getting a computer, that's why I think they feel safe. Because even a tablet, you can't put Google Earth Pro on. You have to have an actual computer computer. And that's more the realm of people in their 40s and 50s and 60s. And we're fairly easy to dismiss. If people can't find it, on their smartphone, they're just not going to bother. So I guess I will leave it there and let you guys make up your own decisions about what you're seeing or perhaps not seeing. But we'll go back to this and I'll show these two years again. And this is one of the weird ones you got to turn around to face south. So there's 10-22-2012, 11-5-2012. And there's actually one more year I'll show. 10-22. Here's 10-19-2009. So 2009-2012. And then not even a month later. Another question you need to ask yourself about this, and I'll leave with it. I know we're at 16 minutes. Why would they image high res a region like this so close together? 11 5 2012, 10 22 2012. That's only 14 days apart. There are images of Antarctica, they don't image but once every couple years. Some they haven't imaged for years. Why would they take so much time to image this and so much effort to swing a satellite over this and image it twice in that short amount of time if there wasn't something important here? So I will leave it there. Uh, God bless. Thank you all for your support. I really appreciate it. Like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Way back when, when the age of exploration occurred, the ships, the farther they went, had to get larger and larger, and they had to send more of them. The reason being, of course, is they had to take civilization with them wherever they went. Now, their version, 15, 16, 1700s, of civilization and our version of civilization are two vastly different things. Back then, bathing was, oh, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Sanitation, eh, you know, whatever. Now, 
a lack of sanitation, a lack of hygiene, a lack of um, personal care would cause all sorts of health problems and nightmares. So the ability to take civilization with us to a region like that, because we wouldn't find it there, and have it be something that is supported and maintained over a long period of time, would be very time, labor, and cost intensive. This is why I've loved to use this picture over and over again. All this shows is one little tunnel with one little bridge and one tiny little outpost off to the right with a couple of lights on inside. Now, just creating something like this would take an enormous amount of effort, even if we had most of the cavern um, already built or already existing, to be able to do something like this. Ice is not something you can blast through with dynamite like you can dirt. You know, you can, uh, with the way ice reacts to explosions, that could be the gift that keeps on giving, if you know what I mean. So that's really the major issue with that. But there was an article I would like to cover today, and it was from the, was it the Guardian or the Observer? It was the Observer. And it talks about Darwin and his trip to the Galapagos Many people don't know that he also went down to the uh, tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego. And he said, something was said, it quoted in his papers, that I think is very, very um, indicative that something major catastrophic had happened recently down there. I hadn't seen this quote before. This is a picture here of a the last living, and this was a long time ago, um, Yagan, native Yagan Indian that existed in the region. Now, I want to, to read this quote um, from one of the captains. Okay, wrote in December 1832. Viewing such men, one can hardly make oneself believe they are fellow creatures and inhabitants of the same world. At night, five or six human beings, naked and scarcely protected from the wind and rain of this tempestuous climate, sleep on the wet ground, coiled up like animals. This was one of the things that bothered um, the explorers about going down here, is the native Indians wore nothing, just like the day they were born. And they describe the reason as, as virtually completely devoid of any redeeming quality whatsoever. They gave it names like Point Desolation, and uh, let me see if I can get this right. It's uh, just very, very um, Port Famine, Desolation Island, and Desolation Bay. Hostile Barren Region. Now, what does that have to do with Antarctica and our belief about there being something happening recently down there, meaning recent to their visit, 1832. This map shows, and this is from about that time, that they were very, very aware of the distance between the tip of Africa and Antarctica. But down here, they show absolutely no distance between the tip of South America and what we know to be Antarctica today. So imagine a people that were used to living in somewhat of a tropical region, like, say, in the South Pacific, where it's warm and it's temperate. You know, maybe they really don't have a use for clothes, or not very many of them. We see this with the Amazon tribes. But what do we know about the situation down there? They had access to seals because... The primary food source for them was seal meat and shellfish. That's also in that article. I'll link the article. You can read it. Why would they not have clothes? And why would they suffer so? With the wind and the salt spray and the cold rain and very, very cold, very... But they would just make these flimsy little wigwams and coil up on the ground. Even... Native American, northern Native American Indians, 
um, up here in North America had far more protection from the elements. What it shows me is that I don't believe those people were adapted to that climate in the sense that over a long period of time that they were used to dealing with that, that it is something that happened to them very recently, last 50, 75, 100 years. And they were just slowly trying to adapt to it. Now, they were able to make the best of it and deal with it, but they end, ended up dying out. The, the Yaga Indians. So, to me, this is more proof that this area down here didn't uh, have the gap that we know it to have today. The huge 300-mile journey, which would have stopped the flow of the weather around Antarctica, which is, by the way, and I want to show this, and the reason I brought this up this way, it's not that Antarctica is at the South Pole that makes it cold and inhospitable. It's that it is isolated down here. You see all these storms? The only reason the waters can swirl down here like this is because of this gap right here. This gap doesn't occur, and this all stays one piece of land. It changes the water currents, which in turn change the air currents, which would make this area a lot warmer, hence... Indians that were not wearing any clothes. And when you look at it, I mean, objectively, you have to see here on the ocean floor that something catastrophic happened. Some, that this was one piece of land right here. We have maps that show it. Even the Perry Reese map, how could the Perry Reese map even exist if what science says about Antarctica is true about how long it's looked like this? This article from the Observer, I think, is just another piece of evidence that something very different was going on in Antarctica as recent as the 1500s. And let's see if I can find that quote real quick. Because while he was down there, Darwin, um, he experienced a volcanic eruption, an earthquake, and a tsunami. So things were still going on, meaning that I wonder if this was like aftershock effect. The Yagan were a nomadic tribe, living mostly on canoes and moving across the bays and channels of Tierra del Fuego, depending on the weather, tides, and most importantly, food. Theirs was almost exclusively sea-based diet of sea lions and shellfish. Pardon me, shellfish. Sea lions have a very thick coat. They could have easily been used for clothing and for making shelters or whatever they needed to, but they didn't. And for 7,000 years, it allegedly, allegedly, it served the southernmost inhabitants of the earth well. Despite the savage cold and prodigious rain, the Yagan sported no clothes and went on land only bunkered down in flimsy wigwams. You see, that's uh, that sounds to me like a culture that was thrown into a situation they weren't well adapted to. And the vast majority of them had died out within just a matter of years. They were a society on the decline. And there are no more of them. So this is what happens to civilizations unprepared for situations like this. We know what we would be getting into going to a place like this. It's incredibly harsh, very inhospitable, and we would have the ability to bring with us, you know, sub-zero uh, jackets and boots and all sorts of things to create heat and warmth and energy and all this, but I truly honestly believe what was encountered by Darwin down there and the explorers was the aftermath, the aftermath of a major event. A tsunami. I really believe it came from the Japan earthquake in seventeen, uh, in the late 1600s, 1700. And what they uh, were encountering down here were people that had lived in the region, but 
the region's climate had changed drastically in a very, very short time because of this massive tsunami and then the earthquakes and the volcanoes. And what then followed down here was the ice was then created. Because there would be no way the Perry Reese map could exist from 1519, showing the exact outline of the land. So, anyway, I'll leave it there. I'll throw all the links down, description, first pin comment, and you can look through all that. But thank you so much. Join us over Twitch night, 8.15, 8.30 to 11.30 every night. Um, I'll probably have my mind made up by then what we're going to do, whether we're going to do the embarrassment of Baranor or the uh, continue the uh, Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Uh, maybe God of War. I thought about that. I had downloaded that a long time ago and never played it. So anyway, um, like, share, subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Hot time, 12 o'clock and 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I'd like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable. First 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no sensors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you and thank you so much.